they, then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not unto one of the least of these, you did it not unto me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Father, bless your word and thank you for it. I pray you'll help me to get through this tonight so that the folks might clearly understand it. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, as you're being seated, come to Romans chapter number 14. Romans chapter 14. Before we get into all this right here, I'll help you maybe to better see some things. Romans chapter 14. And pick it up, if you will, please, in verse number... Oh, let's pick it up in 16. Let not your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy. Where? Romans 14, 16, now 17. Righteousness, joy in what? The Holy Ghost. Alright, come to John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3. Now this will take you a few times of going over it for you to get it. Look if you will please in verse number 1. There was a man of Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher and come from God. No man can do these miracles except thou doest, except God be with him. That thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be, two words, what is it? He cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse number five, Nicodemus, I'm sorry, four, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water, physical birth, and of the Spirit, spiritual birth, he cannot enter into what? Amen. Kingdom of God. And which is born of the flesh is flesh. There's your spirit, there water, birth. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit, spiritual birth. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be, what? Born again. Luke chapter number 17. Luke chapter number 17. Come to Luke chapter number 17. Pick it up after you got the uh, uh, lepers that are healed there. Come down to verse number 20. Luke 17, 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come... He answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is where? Alright, so now, here's the thing I want to show you very quickly, and then I'm going to flip you to the other side of the board. Number one, there would be no need for a new birth before Satan had fallen. Would you agree with that? Amen. Why would he need a new birth? So he would have had both kingdoms, both a spiritual kingdom and he would have had a physical kingdom. But there was no new birth. There was none needed because he hadn't fallen. When Satan messed up, Adam comes on the scene. There's no need here for a new birth. Both kingdoms are present. Can I ask you this question? If that's the case, why would the gospel of the kingdom of God need to be preached? How could the gospel of the kingdom of God be preached if you can't be born again when do you get born again? You can't get born again unless you go all the way down to Calvary. Calvary is when Christ puts the bride together. So the only way you can get born again is Jesus Christ has to die. You're familiar with Romans chapter 7. Surely you are. You know that you can't make the Lord commit adultery. He can't get a wife until the old man's dead. That's why you're crucified with Christ. Once you're crucified with Christ, the inside, uh, this will be in the book of Psalms, your soul that's in there can marry, the, can marry Jesus Christ. You're now available. Why? Your first husband's dead. Your flesh. Amen. Amen. That's Romans chapter 7. Otherwise you make Jesus Christ an adulterer. He's not an adulterer. The old man dies. You're dead in trespasses and sin. So you're on the market. Your old husband's gone and so now you've got a chance to pick up another one. I don't take that and run that and say, oh well, that means that you know everybody has a, a feminine side and all that kind of junk. That's the biggest bunch of foolishness you ever heard in all your life. In that Bible and going all the way back to written history, when a, Bible, when a, when a piece of literature said male, it referred to a male. And when it said female, it referred to a female. It never referred to the opposite. 
A male was a male and a female was a female. There was no confusion about it at all. It wasn't somebody saying, well, I was thinking I probably might have been, maybe, possibly. And now you have the guy with the grapefruit on his head coming up and saying, uh, don't worry about being homosexual or being gay. God made you that way. Yeah. Well, my, 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 who are you to speak for God? Uh, I've been pretty good about not saying anything about him, but I got news for you. He just crossed the book right there. He's saying that homosexuality is okay. Well, you're a liar right out of the pit of hell. If you ain't the Antichrist, you're a false prophet. And if you're not one of those two, you're a, the forbearance of that. The very idea that you're telling somebody they're born that way. The next step, I've told you dozens of times, is going to be that the reason we overlook all the stuff going on down there in the South and all that, meaning in the other countries, and they finally got outed on the deal was they turned a blinded eye to all of the pedophilia going on down there. I guess they must have been born that way too, unless it was your kid they were messing with. That stuff is so wicked it's not even in the Bible. They try to make that stuff so lascivious and things like that that it's okay. Don't worry about Don't get a guilt complex. You're living in a horrible time where you don't get a guilt complex. You're supposed to get a guilt complex. Amen. You should feel bad about doing wrong. Amen. And if not, a preacher ought to tune you up where you feel bad by the time you walk out. Even if you're so mad you could spit nails, it may be the only time you come, but you ought to realize there's going to be a reckoning day come one day and you're going to give an account for everything you do if you're a Christian at the judgment seat of Christ on the other side and it'll be for the works you do. But if not, for every thought. Every thought. Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. Read it. Preachers don't tell you that nowadays. Because why? They don't care about themselves. They care about lying in their pocket. I mean, care about you. They care about themselves. They lie in their pockets. I can't tell people that and people keep coming to church. Empty the church out in a New York second. Teach this kind of stuff. People say, that's just too complicated. I've already gotten that already. I've been watching that thing on the internet. You know, that's, that's stuff for a seminary class and all that. I said, well, why shouldn't the people get it? He said, oh, it's, just, it's just a little too complex. I said, well, then it must be I need to break it down. If you thought what I was saying the other night was too complex, then there's one of two things. Either you're unlearned or I'm not breaking it down, make it simple enough for you to get it. So I need to go over it about ten more times until you get it. Amen. There's nothing that precludes you from knowing all of this. Amen. You know, you're not like a, priest, a, a priestly class or something. We know things you don't know. I'll tell you everything I know if you've got time to listen. It'll take you all of maybe, oh, 15 minutes. <laughs> I saw a book one time that said everything I know about a particular subject and I picked it up and I thought, now that ought to be something worth reading. And all the pages were blank. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, I think they put that book on that shelf for me to pick it up, you know. You can add your title what you want to. There's no new birth needed back here. You say, why? Adam's sinless until he falls. Now when he falls, now all of a sudden the Lord takes that kingdom of God and He takes it back up to heaven with Him and now all you have down here is what they're looking for and I've already told you this, it's a literal, physical, earthly kingdom. And sis, you're going to be right on that thing. That heaven reference there is going to be a reference to dirt. But I'll give you the passages on that later on. Alright, that literal kingdom is going to show up and He's going to run that all the way through. Now, here's what happens. They can't have a new birth, and the reason they can't have a new birth is it requires a sinless Savior. The reason I know that that is doctrinally correct is, is in the Old Testament when they died, if you'll remember the chart or if you have it in the flyleaf of your Bible, you'll find that when an individual dies in the Old Testament before Abraham, if they die before Abraham, while he's Abram, anywhere down in here, they'll go to a Gentile place in the whole of the earth, which is called paradise. After Abraham, that place will be called Abraham's bosom. You can make it the same compartment or you can make it two compartments of the same thing and this will be uh, Gentiles over here and this will be individuals that will be saved uh, by the Jewish way of doing things. But they don't go to hell because they're saved in the Old Testament sense. They can't go to heaven because their sins aren't paid for. So they have to go down. There's a great sermon on that called Where Do the Dead Go? And I wish I had the courage to go ahead and preach it, but the old preacher preached it so well, I don't know that it could ever be re-preached and do it justice. But it should be preached and you should read it and you should watch it and you should watch it at least two or three times a year to get a hold of that thing because it will explain what I'm showing you here. 
Moses comes along with the law, and then after Moses and the law, the judges come up, the judges make a mess of it, and then they have no, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king. They give him a physical king. They had God, but God wasn't good enough. So you know what they decided to do? We want a physical king. For what? A physical kingdom. Well, you know what happens is David comes along after that and then it goes to a bad place there under Solomon. Uh, under Moses, the thing goes down into apostasy, out into uh, Joshua. And then the judges come along there and then the kings come back along here and then David and Solomon come along and then he turns it over to the Gentiles and that thing will be turned over, oh, somewhere in here around 606 B.C. And it stays a Gentile kingdom until the Lord shows up and lo and behold, guess what he does when he shows up? He says, there's two kingdoms that are here. And both of those kingdoms are available to you now. Why? The Bible says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means the restoration of the millennial kingdom is fixing to take place. If you take Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross, you're going to have the millennium. The kingdom of heaven is literally at hand. Within a matter of years, it's at hand. And then he says the kingdom of God's at hand. Why? He's fixing to die back here on Calvary's cross and he's going to have the opportunity for them to have a new birth. Up until now they couldn't get a new birth. Because why? Jesus Christ hadn't died. You can't have the kingdom of God if what you read is true in John 3 and Romans 14 and in uh, Luke chapter 17. You can't have a, a kingdom of God offered unless there's a new birth. Ye must be born again. They can't be born again in the Old Testament. There's no way for them to be born again. It's not even offered to them in the Old Testament for them to be born again. Saved looking forward to the cross. My foot, they're saved looking forward to the cross. You know that there's types that you see, but all that Jew is looking at is he's looking for a king to come in and set up a literal throne on this earth because that's all Isaiah has told him about. That's all the Old Testament prophets told him about. They never saw a church age. They never saw anything about the salvation. All they saw, by grace through faith, all they saw was Jesus Christ crucified and that death of the testator show up and then them offering that to the nation of Israel. They didn't see that. You know what they're looking at? The Bible said they would not have crucified the Lord of glory if they had known that was their Messiah. Do you know why they missed it? Because every Old Testament prophet talked about a king coming in on a white horse and taking over and restoring the kingdom. Acts chapter 1. Sir, Master, wilt thou now restore the kingdom to Israel? Literal, physical, earthly kingdom. Now what I want to try to show you here something tonight that there's a whole lot of foolishness going on because people aren't rightly dividing their Bible. When the rapture takes place, you understand this is called pre-trib. That means before the tribulation. You're not appointed to wrath. You're out. Now that doesn't mean that you may not have problems. I'm sure if you lived in Germany that you would think you must have been in the tribulation. If you lived in uh, Hiroshima or, or Nagasaki when those bombs came down, you would have had to thought if you believed in God at all that that must be the tribulation period. If you lived through some of the things that the people did when they were in Auschwitz, you got over 22 million casualties when Hitler tried to take over and set up his throne there. You have about 6 million Jews that are killed, a little over 6 million of his own troops killed, and then something like 10 or 12 million. That's not count worldwide. That's just Germans. 27 million Russians died in World War II. 27 million. You lost less than a half a, uh, than a, 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 half a million. You lost about 500,000 men. There's a terrible war. I'm not making light of it. But compared to the casualties that were taking place over in Europe, it was nothing. You weren't even a drop in the bucket. Now you lost over 50,000 men over in, uh, in uh, Vietnam. And I can't go into all that. So here's what happens. This is a pre-trib rapture of the church. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to say this to you. And I'll be glad one day I'm going to teach you the seven sevens and the seven mysteries and the seven judgments. And I'm going to teach you the seven baptisms. I'm going to go through all of those things for you again. And some of you that have had it and had it and had it, you're fixing to get it again. You say, why? It's important for you to understand the mysteries. It'll go to keep you to understand the Bible. There's a lot more in that Bible than just don't touch, don't taste, don't handle, don't go here, don't go there, dress this way, look this way. That's what gets you to be a Pharisaical hypocrite. You'll talk about everybody else, but you can't control your mouth. 
You talk about everybody else, but you can't control your fingers. You can't quit looking at what everybody else is doing. It just bothers you they don't do it the way you think they ought to do it. And I just don't believe it. I just don't understand it. Why don't they do this? Why don't they do that? I think they should come to church, and I think they should sing a song, and I think they should do this, and I don't think they ought to be doing this, and I don't think they ought to be doing that. You had not got enough Bible in you to blow your brains out. You couldn't fill up a thimble with what you know. You say, why? The Lord Jesus Christ didn't run around doing that all the time. The Apostle Paul didn't run around doing that all the time. That's a weak sandbox Christian playing in the sandbox. All the time worried about the outward, the outward, the outward, the outward, the outward. The stuff I'll teach you over the next several weeks is a Bible school education on steroids. You'll learn that Bible and know that Bible so that if I croak, you'll at least be able to find your way around. And that's how it ought to be. You'll be able to sit down with your people come Thanksgiving or Christmas time and say, yep, at the Bible, yep, at the Bible, yep, at the Bible, yep, at the Bible. Well, what about this verse? And I don't understand that verse. And what about so on and so forth? I'm going to show you some of them tonight. Here's where unlearned, unschooled individuals are right now. They don't believe now the pre-trib rapture of the church. Well, you don't have a Bible then. If you got that messed up, you're going to mess up everything I'm going to show you now because everything is going to convert to works. How can it convert to works? That kingdom's not even offered right now. During the day and age in which you're living, the kingdom of heaven is not available to you. There's one kingdom available to you, and it's the kingdom of God. Do you know how you get in it? You must be born again. You know how you get in? You get saved by the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. You accept that you're a sinner. You believe Jesus Christ died for your sins according to Scripture, buried, raised again the third day according to Scripture, and you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you want to go to heaven, you trust Jesus Christ. If you want to go to hell, you trust anything else you want to trust. One way to hell is as good as another. Amen. You do whatever you want to do. Well, I trust my grandmother. My grandma said this and all that. I went to such and such a church and I know such and such. I went to such and such a theological seminary, cemetery, or whatever it might be, and I'm just trusting and I'm just believing that God wouldn't put good people in hell. Okay, well, buddy, I won't see you there. I'm going to the other place. Amen. God don't put good people in hell. That's right. You say, what? Then there to everybody be there. There ain't no good people. That's right. You say, who goes to hell? People that didn't trust Jesus Christ. Amen. How is it the kingdom of heaven is available to you? If the kingdom of heaven is available to you by works only, how is it our faith in works in the tribulation, which I'll get to in a second? If that's the case, ladies and gentlemen, how is it available to you today? You can't get it. You have to be saved by grace through faith. It is a kingdom that can't be seen. It's within you. It's inside. If you could get a hold of that, you'd quit worrying about works to get it or works to prove it, or you'd quit looking at everybody else to see whether you think they're really saved or not because they ain't living like you think they ought to live. Amen. Well, give them a few years. They might learn it faster than you did, sister. Or brother. I mean, maybe they'll may, hope and pray, pray this for them. Say, Lord, let them get it before I did, uh, quicker than I got it. And help Amen. them not to have the attitude when they do get it that they look down their pharisaical nose at everybody else. Amen. 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 Good preaching. Amen. Good preaching. Amen. I know it's a teaching, but that's a good preaching for you. All right, now here's what you need to understand. The pre-trib rapture of the church, that means... That Jesus Christ is going to come in the clouds. This will be 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. He says, He show you a mystery. We shall all sleep. We shall all be changed. This is the same thing over the nursery in there. And suddenly at the twinkling of an eye. You'll get that in a second. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Okay, good. I had to wait for you all to catch up on that one. All right, and then he says, uh, we shall all be changed suddenly in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. So people think, oh, well, that means the President Trump's in there and he's the last trump, so we're going to get raptured out of here. I never heard something so foolish in all my life. Well, at Rosh Hashanah, they have an opening trump, they have a mid-trump, and then they have the last trump, that's the third trump. You only have to have two trumps in order to have, uh, for there to be a, a, la a first and a last. In Numbers chapter number 10, there's a silver trump there that represents rep uh, a redemption. One is for the gathering together, and the other one's for the calling out. So it's two trumpets. It's all, it has to be two trumpets. See, when's it going to be? I don't know, but I sure wish it was tonight. Amen. I have no idea when it's going to be. I wish I could. If I could figure it out, I'd go pass out tracks on the expressway, man. I'm, I'm ready to do that now. You say, why? I'm ready to leave. Yes, sir. Amen. I'm ready to leave. You know, you had a greasy spot out there, maybe a big greasy spot out there if somebody ran over me. But my body, I'd be out from the body and present with the Lord. The Lord would look down and say, man, you made a mess down there. Yeah, I sure did. Well, it's too bad. You know, the rapture is going to happen here in about three minutes. <laughs> Wish I'd have hung on just a little while longer, you know. <laughs> 
I told a young lady that one time, and I said I, she was really in dire straits. I wasn't laughing. I was, she was telling me about these demons pestering her and different things like that. She was scared, slapped to death and all that. And she said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill myself, and I'm going to kill myself. And, and I said, okay. She said, I really mean it. I'm going to. I said, I believe you. I really do. I said, are you saved? And she said, yeah, I'm saved. I said, are you sure? And she said, why do you ask that? And I said, well, as soon as you take your pills or blow your brains out, however your choice, slit your wrist and lay in the bathtub, whatever you're going to do, if you're not saved and you made a mistake, there ain't no coming back from it. She said, well, maybe I should ask him now. I said, are you sure you're in the state of mind to do that? <coughs> she didn't kill herself. So... <laughs> Now, now, the pre-trib rapture of the church, that means for you, the rapture takes place, and tonight we don't have time to go into it. The judgment seat of Christ goes on. Why do I bring that up? Because this judgment right here is not this judgment down here. There's another judgment that takes place after this thing up here. And can I just write, well, I'll just write it up here real quick. This is called the great white throne. I just had a friend of mine call me today and he said, well, at the great white throne judgment, this is a preacher talking to him. He said, I just heard a preacher say, the great white throne judgment, a man will be judged by his own conscience. Really? I saw a throne in heaven from whom heaven and earth, had, uh, from whose face heaven and earth fled away. And there's no more sea and he judges them. God judge that, does that judging, your own conscience. Well, you'd be a good, that'd be a good for some of us, wouldn't it? You know, well, if you judge me by my own conscience, I always think I'm right in my own eyes, so I'd be okay. I come out all right. Yeah, but the problem is, is he don't judge that way. He'll judge you by his son, Jesus Christ. Now, maybe some of you think you can stand up to that. I'll tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, at that judgment right there, I would not want to be a pharisaical Christian. You say, why? Because in that Bible, the hardest people that Jesus Christ was on when he was walking on the face of this earth was Pharisees. And if you're a Pharisaical Christian, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes at the judgment seat, let alone whether or not whatever you did in the body or out of the body, you know, I mean, whether you're the, the good or the bad you did in the body uh, being judged, it'd be what kind of a Christian were you? You know what the Lord will say to you? He said, well, I have a Holy Spirit down there. He's a pretty good judge. Wouldn't you agree? What are you doing his job for? I wish I could get some of you people to pray as hard for people as you do when talking about them. I think the reason Christians talk about other Christians is is because you think by putting them down it lifts you up. I think that's what I, that's what I think. Amen. Amen. Oh well, I got to get back to the teaching part here. All right, now the rapture takes place. It's a pre-trib rapture of the church, and that's when you get ready to get out of here and don't know when that's going to be. You'll hear a sound go off. The Lord Himself descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, 1 Thessalonians 4, comfort one another with these words. So you're going to go up there to the judgment seat of Christ, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. There's five crowns up there. There's gold, there's silver, and there's precious stones. There's also wood, hay, and stubble. There's a fire up here. Those things will go into the fire and they'll come out to see of what sort they are. These represent the things that are done with the right motive. These represent the things that are done with the wrong motive. It is not quantity. It is quality. Amen. What was the reason behind why you did what you did? Those crowns all have to do, they have one thing in common. Those five crowns right there have to do in common with or have in common. You love yourself or you love Jesus Christ. Amen. That's how you get the crowns. All right, now that's going on up there in heaven. You've got a new body. You've done shot up through the roof and you floated around up there in the sky and 
you got a tour of the solar system and stuff and you're entering up there into the third heaven you come through the door that's opened up there like Paul said I saw a light sign above the uh, light of the sun and you cross over across that frozen firmament up there that great deep is held back by all that stuff and you step up there into God's presence and all that stuff and the light is so bright you don't even have to worry about having a, a sun or a moon up there in the new Jerusalem because the Lord is the lamb and he's the light of it. So you're up there and you're going to go before a throne and that throne is going to be uh, the judgment seat and the Lord's going to be judging you for what you did. And that's where it'll get real, real to you. That's where every decision you made down here and some of you Pharisees, I'm sorry I'm on Pharisees tonight. Maybe it's because, I'm sure it's because somebody's tuned in. That one person tuned in today, is it getting this, it's for him or her. Uh, I'm sure it's not for you. I'm positive of that. Uh, that's where you Pharisees will get to see Jesus Christ straighten out. Everybody you think should be straightened out. thinking about it? All the ones you've been talking about and all the ones you think need to be straightened out, you'll get to see Jesus Christ Himself straighten them out. Uh, but don't forget, you'll have a turn also. Yes, sir. So He tells you over there in the book of Matthew, He says, Judge not, lest ye be judged. For in whatsoever manner ye judge, ye shall also be judged. So when you're making the judgments, you better make sure you're judging righteously, like the question that came up in Bible study about restoration. You better make sure when you go to restore somebody, you're not doing it just to make yourself look good. Y'all are quiet tonight. You feel like you're going to throw up or something? People say, are you ready for the judgment seat? I don't know about that, but I'm ready to go home. Yes, you're playing tiddlywink, some of you. Some of you Christians, you're playing games. You must have a guilty conscience. You say, why? People with a guilty conscience talk too much. <laughs> all right, what's going on down here? Is this helping you at all? Yes. It was hurting a little bit. All right, we're at the judgment seat of Christ. Who's the judgment seat of Christ for? Christians, bride of Christ. How did they get in there? How did they get into that kingdom? What kingdom is it? Good. How did they get in there? Born again. I won't write the whole thing. Romans 14. Luke 17. Right? John 3. Now I'm going to ask you a question. If the body of Christ is now closed because of the rapture, how can anybody in the tribulation be born again? The only way into the bride of Christ is to be born again. These individuals can't be. They can't be born again. You say, why? The kingdom's gone. The only thing you have down here is the prospect of a coming kingdom. Right down here. I'll show you the key component here in just a second. Here's what they're looking for. They're looking for a coming kingdom. They're looking for a coming king. They're looking for the Son of Man to show up. Battle of Armageddon, second coming. That takes place and then judgment of nations. 144,000, this is in Romans chapter 14, uh, Revelation chapter 14, 144,000 male virgin Jews. These are virgins. That's Matthew 25. Those aren't females. That's virgin Jews. Matthew 25 has nothing to do with you at all. Matthew 25 has to do with some people in the tribulation who have a responsibility to keep their lamps filled with oil and if they don't, when the bridegroom comes, they're in trouble. The bridegroom doesn't come to marry them. The bridegroom comes to meet them. There's a difference. The bridegroom, when he comes, is already married. That's Matthew chapter number 25. The wise virgins and the foolish virgins. Well, you know, if you have the initial evidence of baptism of the Holy Ghost, you've got the Holy Ghost in you. And if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, then when Jesus Christ comes, you'll be okay. But if you leaked out, you fell off, and it popped out the top of your head or whatever it might be, if you went to get it and you didn't get it by works and this and that and the other, then you don't have it, and you're not going to make it, and you're going to be, uh-uh, no, uh-uh. That has to do with the 144,000 male virgin Jews and their converts. 
Uh, this will be in Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation 14. I realize this is kind of deep. These are they that had the faith in Jesus Christ and, and kept the commandments. Could I ask you a question? Do you keep the commandments? I mean, you should. <laughs> but do you have to keep them to be saved? Wouldn't you be in a mess if you did? I would. All right, so now let me ask you a question. If this kingdom is now closed, it's closed at the rapture. If that's the case, how could they be born again? First, or 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, he tells you that these that didn't love the truth are going to believe a lie because when they had the chance to get the truth, they didn't get the truth and God calls them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. They can't be saved. The only way you get saved in this time period is the preaching of the 144,000 male virgin Jews and they're preaching the kingdom. Repent and be baptized. The king is coming. The king is coming. The king is coming. The king is coming. That's what they're looking for is here. All right, now, let's talk about the thing that I wanted to talk to you about tonight for just a minute or two. I hope it'll help you. Look, if you will, please, in Matthew chapter 25. Anybody getting any, uh, uh, making any sense of it at all? Matthew chapter number 25. Pick it up in verse number 31. I said 41, so it's 31. I was close. Brother Holland covered for me. Apologize. All right, look at verse number 31. At least I had the one right. Notice who comes. Uh, the unprofitable servant is cast into outer dark and weeping, gnashing of teeth, and so on and so forth. Notice verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come, the Son of Man, who's he connected with? Which kingdom is the Son of Man connected with? Heaven. Kingdom of heaven, literal, physical, earthly kingdom. They're looking for Mary's Son, Son of Man. We look for the Son of who? God. The Son of Man shall come in His glory with all His holy angels with Him. Then He shall sit upon the throne of His glory. The throne of His glory. There it is. This same Jesus that left will so come in like manner. And before Him shall be gathered all nations. And He shall separate one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. You've got to pause a second. So he's dividing nations. No, he's dividing individuals in nations. This isn't a national judgment. This is a judgment of individuals that were a part of nations. He puts the sheep on the right hand and he puts the goats on the left hand. So here comes people from, say, oh, I don't know, Asia. And they come up there. He doesn't judge the entire nation. He judges the people in that nation of Asia and said, did you take care of my people? Notice the brethren that are there in the passage. Look at it we'll, in verse number 40. And the king, well, the king, yeah, the king, what are we looking? Kingdom of heaven, literal, physical, earthly kingdom, shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren. Who's the brethren? You say that's saved individuals. No, it's not. It's the Jews. It's the Jews. It's what did they do in the tribulation period? You've done it unto me. Then she say, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting power, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now watch. Hungry, thirsty, stranger, naked, sick, prison, visited me, and so on and so forth. When saw you we there? Uh, the same thing that you pray. Lord, uh, uh, when he prays the prayer in uh, the book of Matthew there, he prays the disciples' prayer. Give us this day our what? daily bread and forgive us our trespasses we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into but deliver us from evil. there is the uh, antichrist for thine is the and the power and the glory forever and ever right on earth as it is in we want that thing to come down here so what happens in the tribulation period is there's faith and works that are involved here. And then when he come down at the uh, second advent, that's at the battle of Armageddon. That is not the battle of Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog take place way out here at the end of the thousand years. Don't fall for all this junk being told you nowadays that people that don't study their Bible. Well, we know that that's, you know, the Syrian thing going on over there. And in Syria, you know, Damascus and the troops from Russia came down and this and that and the other. That battle takes place and God fights that battle. 
This is a nation that rises up against the Lord after the devil's loosed for a little season there and he's brought up out of the pit and taken over there and he goes to Russia and he gathers an army and he comes against Jerusalem. It is not this battle over here. That's the battle of Armageddon. That's the battle you got coming. You get to come with him for that battle. But before that, there's going to be a big war and drive every Jew out of the, out of the uh, uh, nation of Israel. They're going to hide in the Red Rock City of Petra. Not going to be many of them left. There'll be a very small remnant. All right, so this judgment of nation takes place. Here comes people from China. Anybody in China that helped out the Jew? Helped out the Jew. Where in that passage do you see somebody, if you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and trusted Him as your personal Savior, and you believed the death and the burial and the resurrection, and you looked into the cross, looked back at the cross, then you can be saved. Where do you see it in there? I'll save you the time. It ain't in there. You say, why? That's not how they're saved. Not only that, notice what they're doing. The king shall say, verse number 34, the sheep and the goats are on the right hand, the sheep on the right hand, the goats on the left hand. Watch this. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Oh my goodness. From all the way back there with Adam, what was it? It was a literal, physical, earthly kingdom. And you know what they get passage into? They get passage into the millennium. And then they get to go into the millennium and they die in the millennium. They come up at the great white throne judgment and then they wind up living eternally. And they're down here on earth. The earth belongs to the Jews. The Gentiles take over all the other stuff. We'll talk about that later. This judgment of nations that takes place right here is not uh, did the nation of China do this and the nation of Africa do that and did the nation of Australia do this. And it, no, it's individuals from the nations and if you help the Jew, then you get to get in and if you didn't help the Jew, then you go to hell. Depart from me, you curse and an everlasting fire. It's all works. The only way that you would believe that that would be true is if you had the faith in Jesus Christ and kept the commandments. What's the commandment? You better take care of that Jew. I'll bless you if you do and I'll curse you if you don't. That's what's being judged there. This judgment right here has nothing to do with an individual that gets to go to heaven. This is an individual that gets to enter into the kingdom prepared for them from the, since the foundation of the world. It's Jewish. They get a literal, physical, earthly kingdom. By the way, if you're saved and you're here tonight and you're saved, you'll be at that judgment, but you don't have to worry about it. You've already got your judgment over with up here. Your judgment on your sins was done back at Calvary. You don't have to worry about your sins being judged or your conscience or anything else. You say, why? You're already done with that. Thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ. But ladies and gentlemen, think about this for just a minute and I realize I'm going fast, but I want you to ask this question. If the kingdom of God has to do with those that are born again in the body of Christ, if it's no longer here, how can these people get in it? And the answer is they can't. The only thing they can get into is into the millennium and then they can get an eternal body to live when they come up at the great white throne judgment, Revelation chapter number 11, they receive that body and they're able to get a reward and they go into out past the millennium into eternity with an eternal body but not a glorified body like yours. They get it by partaking of one of the twelve fruits of the twelve trees through one of the twelve gates during one of the twelve months that is uh, uh, officiated by one of the twelve apostles. It's Jewish, 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 Jewish. 12, 12, 12, 12, 12. Verse number 35. I was hungered and you gave me meat and thirsty you gave me to drink. The stranger you took me in. Naked you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. The righteous answer him and say, Lord, when saw you that way? And then he said, when the king comes and he sits down, he said, well, you've done it to the, my brother and the Jew. And if you've done that, you have a right to the kingdom. And if you don't, verse 46, they go away into everlasting punishment and righteousness into a life eternal. Which one do you want? You want the punishment or life eternal? Here's the answer. You don't have to worry. <laughs> Amen. You say, why? That's not your judgment. You say, but it's a judgment. Yeah, but it's not yours. This judgment takes place here. They don't get that judgment. You say, why? This judgment is a secluded individual bunch that are there. Uh, it's a, a defined bunch of individuals that are in the body of Christ. The only time you can get in the body of Christ, ladies and gentlemen, is during the age from the time of Calvary to the rapture. That's the only time you can get in. 
The body of Christ was predominantly Jewish in its inception after they rejected the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter number 7. The Lord shut the door on that thing and then transitionally began to move things using the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter number 9 and within three years, Acts 15 is there and the Apostle Paul is preaching an entirely different gospel than they ever preached anywhere else in the Bible and you had to get saved that way or you wind up going to hell. You say, well, I don't believe that. Okay, fine. As long as you believe you're saved by grace through faith in this age. But your Bible is going to be a mess to you if you don't learn to make these divisions. Amen. There's so many judgments in those Bibles that if you don't get those judgments right, you get that thing messed up. People say you don't have to worry about the judgment seat of Christ. As a matter of fact, one of the things that they do is, is they tie these two judgments together. Amen. They say they're the same thing. They're not the same thing. They're not even spelled the same way. They're not even for the same people. Take a Bible look at Revelation chapter number 11. Revelation 11. Oh man, it's 8 o'clock. Can you give me just a couple minutes? It's hard to, hard to find a break off place. Y'all are always real kind to me. You say, yeah. <laughs> I know it's kind of a rhetorical question. I, I, one of these days you're going to say, no, let's go home. <laughs> Some of you got the million mile stare. I know you're tired. Look at verse 15. Revelation 11, 15. This is an odd thing. The seventh angel sounded, and this is parenthetical. This is going on here in the book of Revelation, and he's going to pause, and it's going to take you from beginning to end. The seventh angel sounded, and there was great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms, 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 kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms, plural, more than one, of our Lord, not just land grants, but also spiritual, and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Four and twenty elders sat before God and the seats fell upon their faces, worshiped God, that'll be a sight, saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art washed and art to come. That art to come is uh, taken out of all your new Bibles. You say, Why? They don't believe in a coming king. Because of power, uh, excuse me, be, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. The millennium is over. You're all the way out there at the very end on the bottom of that thing. The millennium is now over with. The Bible says this, and the nations were angry, and the time of thy wrath, and thy wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear the name, small and great, shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. You know what he's talking about? <clears throat> you say it's just the wicked dead that are out here. No, it's not just the wicked dead. You know what's out here? This is tribulation saints that are judged out here. This is all the people that aren't in the body of Christ. This goes all the way back to Adam, Noah. Where do they get their judgment? People don't think about that. Where do Adam and Noah get their judgment? You say the judgment seat of Christ. How could it be the judgment seat of Christ? They're not born again. Amen. What happened to Abraham? What happened to Moses? What happened to the nation of Israel? What happened to all those people that are there? They can't get judged up here. They're not born again. When do they get their reward? Well, everybody just shows up over here. You're getting lazy in your study. We show up over here, but we already got our reward. We're done. At that reward right there, you have a robe that's there of your own righteousness. You get His righteousness, which is gold, and then you have a robe of your own righteousness that according to Psalm 45, you're sowing right now. You're putting stitches in it. When you do right, you put stitches in. And when you don't do right, you don't. I don't know how much of you is going to be covered or not. But the Bible says in Revelation 3, you can be naked and ashamed and be there. Nowadays, you can show up there in heaven and you'd think, oh, well, I guess it'd be okay because nowadays people are in all manner and state of undress and it's no big deal. You're headed back to the garden. See, there's nothing wrong with me. That's why I run around naked. But you get up there in front of God Almighty running around naked, you know what it'll be? It'll be like the Lord coming down there, walking with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening, and he said, where are you at? And Adam said, I'm over here in the bushes. He said, what in the cat hair are you doing in the bushes, boy? He said, I was naked and ashamed. Who told you you were naked? Well, I ate a piece of fruit there, and it kind of opened my eyes up and told me things. And don't you wish, don't you wish, don't you wish, don't you honest to God wish you never knew what evil and wickedness was? Don't you wish that? I do. I wish I didn't know all that. I, I, I really do. I wish I hadn't been exposed to all that stuff. Well, it's just life. I, I understand that, but I wish I didn't know all that stuff. I wish I didn't know all that cesspool of junk up there in my head. I wish I didn't know. I wish I'd just walk around innocent, you know, didn't know any better. 
I, I, I think Herbie was like that. I don't think he saw bad in anybody. I just think he was just innocent. He didn't have, he had no guile at all. He just, you know, he thought everything was good as long as he was in church. <laughs> and I thought, man, you know, in a way that's kind of a gift. He couldn't do much and all that kind of a deal, but he, he didn't let people bother him or nothing. Anyway, the great white throne judgment, you just read it, to give rewards to thy servants, the prophets. That means everybody that shows up up there that hasn't got their reward at the judgment seat of Christ, the great white throne judgment won't just be for the wicked dead and for all the wicked people that are alive at the time of the great white throne judgment when heaven and earth pass away and the old things are gone and just the throne is there. When you get out there, you got everybody since the angels have come around and they come through and they get their reward there or they get bound hand and foot and thrown in the lake of fire. And they stay there till God dies at the lake of fire. And it looks like that lake of fire is kindled out there in the midst of the universe somewhere before the Lord recreates everything else and somewhere down at the bottom of that thing. And it could be that it just floats. I don't know how the thing goes, but that lake of fire stays there forever that God kindles with His wrath and it burns and burns and never burns out. And everybody that comes to the great white throne, that's their final judgment. And they get pitched off of there, off of up there in eternity. And down they go, screaming and hollering, amen in their own damnation, and splash into the lake of fire and stay there. And God forgets they existed. Writes them off. Right. Have me removed. Amen. I'll take the Calvary. You say, well, you're just a chicken. Yeah. I'm a peacock, but I'm, I'm a chicken too, man. I want out. I want out. What fool would not take a chance to get out of that? Well, I just don't believe it. Well, you cannot believe it and go there anyway. Whether you believe it is immaterial. Well, God said it, I believe it. That's it. Uh-uh. No, no. God said it, that settles it. Amen. You're not as important as you think you are. I just believe. No, you know, it don't make no difference. You better trust Jesus Christ. So out here, and I don't have time to go into it tonight. I'll cover it for you on Sunday. At the great white throne judgment, ladies and gentlemen, all the prophets will be out there. All the preachers will be out there. All the people that were out there in the Old Testament will be there. All the people in the tribulation, all the people in the millennial kingdom, all of them will get their reward out there. And everybody that's a human being and the angels before that time that have fallen will come up right there. And if they're already in hell, they'll come up out of hell. They'll stand up there and they'll give an account and they'll compare themselves to Jesus Christ. And then off they'll go into eternity forever and burn forever. They chose to pay for their own sins. Now, I know I covered a ton of material there in a real short period of time, but that give you a basic overview and we'll cover it again before I start into the sevens and at the end of the sevens I'll go back over the whole thing again just to make sure you get it locked in and once you get that you start reading that Bible you'll start seeing stuff in there you've never seen before you'll say man look at that man look at that man look at that and then somebody will come up to you and they'll say well now you know I believe that you know that you have to have a anointing oil <coughs> brother Lance was talking about earlier he had to go to work Brother Lance will say, hey, you know, you got some oil? Well, well, you got it in James 5. Flip to James 5 right quick, real quick. Just got to back up a little bit. It goes Genesis, Exodus, James. <laughs> Surely you've heard this taught before. Verse number 14. 13, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith shall save the sick, not save in the sense of save you eternally, save you in the sense of physical damnation and make you well, get you better. The Lord shall raise him up and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven. Uh, what? So I just got sick and I got a problem and I call for the elders of the church, that's pastors of churches, and they come over there and they throw a little 40 weight on me and I get better and that means my sins are forgiven. How are your sins forgiven? At Calvary, but in the tribulation, if you're sick, you call for somebody, they come anoint you, and the Bible says it shall save. They get up, there's no misfire. There's none of this charismatic foolishness where somebody calls down there and says, you know, I got heal my ball head or I got a gorder on me or, or whatever it might be. I mean, it says you pray, he gets up, and if he has sinned, his sins are forgiven him. You say, what are you doing? You're back down in the time of Jewish time because sin's connected with sickness. 
Matthew 10, go not to the way of the Gentile and the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Go healing the sick, cleansing the leper, casting out demons, signs. Sin is connected with sickness. And then he says this, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another and you may, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man avail much. Well, I've had some righteous men pray a lot of times and the people do get well. I had some of the most righteous men I've ever known in my life pray for my dad. Of course, he did get healed. <laughs> he's better now than he's ever been. Uh, but in this context, it's physical. If you don't make that right, you know what you get? You get healing lines and Scripture to back it up and calling for people to put paws on you and put oil all over you and that kind of a thing. I don't, don't bother me if that's what you want to do, but you can't expect to get up from it. I've been in hospitals, my wife and I have been in hospitals many, many, many times, walking through the corridors of the hospitals and stuff like that and going in to pray with people and things and running into priests and running into charismatic people and running into women with a little bottle of oil. And they're going in there and they, you know, sprinkle the oil on there and then they pray over them. And most of them have picked up the Catholic thing and they'll mark them right here and, and they're praying over them. Some of them, I've seen them leaning there in the bed and you walk by there and they're leaning over them like this and they're pouring oil on them and they all got their hands on them and they're praying, you know, that the Lord's going to get them up and we claim James chapter 5, you know. Effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man. Well, if that's the case and you wind up leaving and I'm not going with you, you must not be righteous then. Because in the passage, it has nothing to do with the faith of the man that's sick. It has to do with the righteous men that are in there. And here's the thing they don't like about it. In the context, before you pray over somebody, you're confessing your faults one to another. Before you open your mouth in prayer for that individual, you're publicly telling each other where you got a problem. A fault, not a sin, but something that could be a sin. You wouldn't find too many people wanting to pray over somebody if they had to do that. And the righteousness is, is they didn't lie about it. They told you where that fault line was, that secret fault line that's there that could crack any minute. All right, we'll stand together and be dismissed. I hope that makes a little bit of sense to you anyway. Brother Heiko back there in the back corner, it's good to see you. I know you've been working a lot of hours and stuff, and I'm glad you made it to church. How about you dismiss us in prayer, would you please? Dear Father, we come to you, Lord, and just... First, we just want to tell you that I love you and I thank you, Lord, for giving us a church like this, and especially the pastor that you've given us, Father. And 